The Mac Studio with Apple's new M1 Ultra chip is a super powerful device, but it also costs 4,000 US dollars, which is six times more expensive than its younger brother, the M1 Mac Mini, which comes in at $699. And this begs the question, is the Mac Studio six times more powerful than the M1 Mac Mini? In this video, we're going to compare them in everything from port selection, coding, creative workflows, 3D modeling, gaming, and more. So these devices are obviously aimed at different target markets. The Mac Mini is just a great all-round entry-level computer, whereas the Mac Studio is aimed more at professionals. Is this going to be a fair comparison? Absolutely not, but it's still fun to compare the two. All right, so let's have a quick chat about ports first of all. Now, I won't go into too much detail because there's not a massive difference between the two. One thing I will say is that I personally ran out of ports on the Mac Mini very, very easily. So you only have two Thunderbolt ports on the back on the Mini versus four on the Mac Studio and another two Thunderbolt ports and also an SD card on the front. Now this is such a big difference in my opinion because you'll notice the lack of IO options on the Mac Mini. So if you wanna plug anything into this device, you have to somehow fiddle around and plug it into the back. Now you also get a 10 gigabit ethernet port built into the Mac Studio. And this is also available on the Mac Mini, but for an extra $100. The dimensions are obviously quite different and the M1 Ultra Mac Studio is much heavier due to the copper heatsink inside it. But both of these devices are going to be sitting on your desk the entire time. So I don't think weight really matters all that much. Okay, let's start with some synthetic benchmarks for the CPUs. Starting with Cinebench, there was of course a significant difference between both devices. The Mac Studio was three times faster, which makes sense because it has 20 CPU cores compared to just eight for the Mac Mini. Although for single core scores, there was barely any difference. Again, this makes perfect sense because they're both running the same M1 silicon with the same clock speeds. So if your workflows consist mainly of single core stuff, so Photoshop files, uh, moving around the viewport in Blender, for example, you may not actually notice that much of a difference between the two. So what about programming and coding for all the developers and software engineers out there? Well, there is a significant improvement with the M1 Ultra, but only by around 50% or even less when considering very complex tasks such as building WebKit in Xcode. It seems that even though on paper the core count more than doubles, this doesn't necessarily translate well to real life workflows. Okay, so how about creative workflows on Adobe? Well, I tried to run the After Effects Puget Bench benchmark on the Mac Mini, but it kept failing due to insufficient RAM. So if we look at a real life project, here's a short 2D animation. The Mac Studio completed it significantly faster, but the Mac Mini kept up pretty well, coming in at just 2.5 times slower. After Effects is extremely RAM intensive, so a lot of this difference is coming from the fact that we're really comparing eight gigabytes of RAM versus 64 gigabytes on the Studio. We see the same results in Lightroom Classic and Premiere Pro, and you'll also notice the significant difference in live playback and effects score both of which will have the biggest impact on the editing experience. Speaking of editing, let's take a quick look at video editing. Starting with a multicam project, here we have four streams of really demanding 4K footage from assorted GoPro, Sony, and Blackmagic cameras. Now there's actually a ton of really demanding and high quality footage on this timeline. And if you wanna see this in more depth, I'll link a video where I talk about all the different codecs, effects, color corrections, and so forth. The multicam timeline is flawless on the M1 Ultra, but is just barely acceptable on the Mini, but improved slightly by bumping timeline resolution down to 1080p during editing. So if you had some slightly less demanding footage or perhaps you transcoded or proxied one or two streams of footage, the editing experience actually would not be too bad on the Mac Mini. And we all know timeline performance is by far the most important thing when editing because you spend 95% of your time here, not sitting around waiting for a render to finish. That being said, rendering out this 20 minute project in 4K and H.264, there really wasn't that much of a massive difference, even with all the video hardware encoders and decoders built into the M1 Ultra chip. Now, considering this is actually a fairly demanding editing workflow, I think the Mac Mini's actually held up really, really well here. And the performance was very, very impressive 
compared to this more expensive machine. So just for fun, I loaded up a two minute timeline featuring 8K red raw footage from a red camera with minor color correction. Rendering this out in 8K DNxHR 444 10-bit, the difference is more pronounced as this type of footage is where more powerful systems really start to pull away from entry level ones. Moving on to some 3D work, Blender in particular recently got a massive update, allowing it to use metal for cycles rendering. The Blender results between the two are pretty much what you'd expect with twice the CPU cores and six times as many GPU cores. The M1 Ultra was around five to six times faster in every scene, except when artificially limited to just the CPU, where it was roughly three times faster. I also threw in the teapot render from Octane X, which gave similar results. Now that being said, you probably won't go for an Apple Silicon Mac if you're doing complex 3D rendering and modeling, for example, but it's still interesting to see how the GPU actually scales fairly linearly here. Okay, so what about gaming? Sure, you probably won't be doing much gaming on either machine due to poor optimization and lack of support for most game APIs, but we can still compare the two. Starting with GFX Bench, there's a noticeable difference, about the same as what we were seeing in the Blender GPU renders. This is the same with the Metal GPU score on Geekbench, and in real life, the exact same differences can be seen visually when comparing a game like Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p ultra settings. Looking at SSD speeds, they were actually fairly similar between the two when looking at at read speed, but the Mac Studio with its base one terabyte SSD does see a large boost in write speeds. Now, Apple does market the Mac Studio as having a really, really fast SSD, but the reality is you only get those speeds if you upgrade the SSD to something like a four terabyte or eight terabyte option. Now, let's have a quick chat about some of the fan noise and thermal differences between the two. Now, if you guys are a fan of the channel, you would know I generally like to whip out the FLIR thermal camera, uh, also do some decibel testing on these machines. I literally do not need to do that here. Neither machine gets hot, neither machine makes any fan noise, even fully when under load, and they're just an amazingly quiet and cool uh, machine to have on your desk, especially coming from, say, a Windows machine with an Intel i9 or an RTX 3080. Yes, of course, that's more powerful in other areas, but just being able to sit down and never hear this machine or never have the room heat up is amazing. And there's really no differences between the two in that regard. Now, in terms of power draw, it is obviously increased on the M1 Ultra Max Studio, but not as much as you'd think. Okay, so there was a clear winner in this video in terms of performance, and it definitely was not the Mac Mini. But I have to say, I'm extremely impressed with how well this machine actually kept up with this Mac Studio, which is six times more expensive. You know, if we look at a number of different workflows, such as coding and development, so uh, doing that WebKit build, uh, also editing that particular 4K multi-cam timeline and also some After Effects renders. I mean, this was only about two to two and a half times slower than this machine, despite being six times less expensive. And considering that this machine is 18 months old at this point, and it's holding up this well to a $4,000 brand new machine, I think that's pretty much the best bang for buck you can get uh, in terms of Macs right now. Anyway, guys, hopefully you enjoyed this video. Apart from that, I'll catch you in the next one.